Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. In today's special ASCO 2021 GI episode, Eva Segaloff and Hans Prennan chat to Pam Kunz and Mark Peters. Addressing both upper and lower GI, both interviews cover practice-changing developments and controversial trials. As ever, you'll find full bios, Twitter handles and all the links to the papers discussed in the notes on our website. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. Well, g'day, g'day, g'day. Now, in a rather desperate move to increase Belgian listeners, Hans has invited his boss, the wonderful friend to all of us, Australian and international oncologist Mark Peters, to join us for this fun and insightful post-ASCO GI roundtable. My first question to Mark, how many listeners do you think you'll be able to get? We would try to have 100 Belgian listeners, so 100. And that's your six children, you said? Absolutely. Listening about 10 times each, okay. (laughs) The bar's not very high, Mark, but seriously... If I put 100 on the table and Hans put another 100 on the table, it's already 200. Yes, but I'm already trying for one year. (laughs) But Hans hasn't got over seven. (laughs) You could replace him as a host, perhaps. Okay, that's the target. Fantastic. So number one question, Mark, how was this ASCO for you and what did you think about the lower GI data at ASCO? First of all, it was a different one. It was the same situation that you couldn't attend lively this ASCO, so that makes a difference in the interaction. But otherwise, it gives you the opportunity to see the presentation in much more detail. The second answer to your question is, what was the, let's say, the impact on the data that were presented on lower GI? I must say, somewhat disappointing. It was the same things that were already discussed in previous meetings, going in somewhat more detail, but not new data that will change our attitudes in the near future. You're trying to get people to stop listening to the podcast already. That That's not a good strategy. <laughs> yes, but there will come some interesting questions now. So Wait, now it's your turn to ask questions and then we go into interaction. So it's not because there is not many new things that we can discuss deeply, the things that are available. So that makes the difference between the previous podcast and this one. No, that's excellent. And just before we get into the studies, do you think Hans, you're his boss, do you think he went to more sessions because it was virtual than he does when he's in Chicago at the bar? (laughs) Absolutely, yes. I'm going to answer instead of Hans. I did it at night during my consultation. So I was busy, busy, busy attending the ASCO meeting. Okay, fantastic. Now to grill you on that statement, I'm going to hand over to Hans to ask about various impactful abstracts. Okay, because I thought we had agreement that I was going to lead the conversation, but you started it. So, okay, I'm very glad I can take over now. So, Mark, please, what can you tell us? I think I'm also a bit disappointed because I'm waiting already for years now to see new data in colon, and we're always redigesting the same data over and over. We try to find biomarkers, which treatments don't work, but I want to know which treatments work. And also, I think the major achievement is within MSI High that we have now immune therapy. Yeah, I I think that is the major achievement over the years. It's just Thierry and André presented the final analysis of Keynote 177, and it's confirming what we already knew, that there is an impact on PFS, which is clearly different from the control, that there is an impact on quality of life, and that most of the side effects are currently well known, 
by oncologists and that we can diagnose in time and treat when it's necessary. The only thing that is missing, but it's not remarkable, is the overall survival because you have a crossover of almost 36%. And even then you had patients that got immune therapy in another setting. So it's not amazing that you don't find an overall survival, but the data are so robust that this is really the standard for the moment in this small niche of patients that we are treating. But still, I wonder there a bit, because you know there's a relation between BRAF mutated patients, MSI high. We say, okay, if you're MSI high, BRAF mutant, you have some preference for, let's say, the immune therapy, but you also know that some tumors are quite aggressive being BRAF. So then the question still remains whether we should start with chemo or with immune therapy in that population. That's the difficult one. That is also the question that was somewhat answered by the study presented by the German group, trying to find out which combination is better, the full foxery bevacizumab or the full foxery cetuximab uh, regimen. I was disappointed. It was a phase two study, which didn't convince me that the combination with triple chemotherapy with one of the antibodies is really the one that we need. And I hope to see very soon the beacon regimen implemented and reported in the first line setting. If you see there a clear good response and meaning over 50%, then this might be the first option in aggressive BRAF mutated tumors. Otherwise, probably we will go for immune therapy first, but we still have to wait the results. But then we need to make a new study there because then you have to give immune therapy a second line, which we don't have a study for. Yeah, that's true. If I could give my strategy at the moment that we have the data available and that you have a combination that have a higher response than the immune therapy in this population, I would go for, let's say, two or three months of the combination and then switch to immune therapy, not giving until progression, but at the moment that you have a response, have a deep response, then switching to immune therapy and see what is happening in these patients. For me, that would be the best strategy. And in that study, there was that very early group that did worse with the immune therapy versus chemotherapy. Do you think the BRAF mutants account for that group? If I remember well, they already looked into the detail and it didn't explain everything. So it might be partly the answer to your question, but still we, and it's not only in colorectal that we see that drop in the beginning in the immune therapy. Also in other tumor types, you see that drop in the beginning and we don't have a clear explanation for that. And one final question. Do you think the issue of chemo plus immunotherapy first line needs to be answered for the metastatic colorectal MSI high group? Or do we just accept the immunotherapy alone data? For me, it would be much clearer to have a sort of strategic sequencing setting, short course of chemotherapy, induction of response, and then switching to immune therapy. The question is, do we need a combination up front? Probably this would add some toxicity in the beginning to these patients. You would lose some patients. So for me, the sequence would be a better strategy than going for the combination. But that's my personal opinion. Yeah, the question I still have is, as you know, in some tumors, if we speak about MSI high, it doesn't seem so homogeneous as we think. Absolutely. And we always think, okay, if you go for metastasis and the primary and their MSI, they're all MSI. But it seems there's some data that sometimes metastases are not MSI while the primary is MSI. So this could also maybe explain in colon why some of them don't respond why we call them MSI, but maybe the metastases don't have the characteristics of the MSI. Yeah, I completely agree, Hans. And it was the same story years ago when we started to treat our patients based on RAS status. We know that from the fraction of patients with RAS wild type, there is still a group that doesn't respond even if they are a RAS wild type. So we have to for sure dig further into the details, not only on the primary tumor, but also on the metastasis, because this is a heterogeneous disease and and probably there is a fraction of patients that have in their metastatic profile something else than in the primary tumor, for example. 
Yes, just to add, there is some studies that seem that when they have peritoneal metastasis, it seems it's, there is a bit more discordance than when you have, let's say, lung metastasis. But I think it has to be validated in larger studies. That's why I think tissue is the issue. We should try to get as much tissue as we can to do the analysis. I think at a certain moment I was in Australia and that was one of the slides that I presented. So absolutely, I only can confirm that. So besides the immune therapy, was there any new drugs, let's say, in colon or something that might come in the future? The new drugs, you have seen the data on the DESTINY trial with trastuzumab uh, deruxitecan. This is also the confirmation what we already have seen. The main problem there is still the toxicity, although they minimize the toxicity, but still there's interstitial lung disease might be a problem in this setting. So this was for sure something that might change our attitude in her two positive patients. Although looking into the subgroups, probably it's the her two, three plus that is doing the best under that treatment. And for the others, it's very difficult to conclude based on the destiny data that we have seen. What for me was the most interesting was the study presented by the Milan group on the reintroduction of anti-GFR based on the liquid biopsy information. Although a very small trial, although it's hypothesis generating, it met the primary endpoint, which was very limited primary endpoint, but it's very interesting for the first time to see some prospective data that might guide your decision in the future. Yes, fully agree. And coming back to this HER2, I think the main message there is not only besides Tratuzumab Durextic, and there are many more trials, as you know, ongoing. I think HER2 is something which should be performed standard in colon cancer these days. Do you agree? Yeah, I think we completely agree. The question is only, and that is linked to the availability of the drugs in this setting. For me, it would be good to have this information up front when we could decide on the biomarker profile, not only on BRAF, RAS, HER2 status, but also, for example, the link towards the anterior case story. Having that information available at the beginning must be very informative to guide our decision. But as you know, Hans, and probably it's the same story in Australia, in Belgium, there is registration of drugs, there is reimbursement of drugs. So the flexibility is relative low because we are still thinking in the strategy of going from one line to another and not having the flexibility to have all the drugs available and to base our decision on the molecular profile and also the patient profile. Can I ask you, Mark, do you make sure that it's not just immunohistochemistry, but you're also looking for HER2 mutations, which are much more common in colon than, say, in breast, where it's really overexpression? Yeah, but that is under pressure of Hans because he needs patients for studies. So that's the reason. And we have a very, let's say, inventive and very active molecular pathologist. So that is the reason why we are trying to see it broader than only going to immunohistochemistry. So for our center, this is almost a routine, but this is not the case in every center in Belgium treating these patients with colorectal cancer. And that is the I think the struggle that we are now having is that colorectal cancer has a very high incidence in our population. Before it was, the treatment was very easy because you only had chemotherapy, but it's becoming much more complex than before. And the complexity might have also a reflection on the prognosis in the future of these patients. If we don't see the complexity, probably this will impact negatively the prognosis of our patients. Okay, I think this nicely summarizes the data of the ASCO for colon at least. I think not much novel, but I think a little bit on immune therapy. Still the message that we have told us in several podcasts already to co- try to completely yeah, look at the broad genetic profile of your tumor to be able to treat them within either trials or maybe in the future reimburse new drugs. These are the main messages, I think. Yeah, I just want to mention the huge effort that was done in Focus 4. The idea is very good. And I was, as an independent person involved in Focus 4, but looking to the struggle that they had to have the different arms with the new drugs available, that is one. 
Second, the fact that they are now coming with the most easy one, <laughs> capsizing versus monitoring. And also the fact that having a period of induction and then going to another strategy, the complexity of running such a trial is enormous still today. And this is somewhat disappointing because you clearly have an idea. You want to go for a strategy of induction based on your molecular profile. Then you will want to go to one of the drugs that we have available. But it's very difficult to run such a type of trial in a very good way. And that's a pity because this might be very informative. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you a question relating to GI cancers and relating to the fact that we're going to interview Pam Kunz to talk to us about upper GI cancers. Now, there was a slide presented called Women's Representation in Leadership of GI Clinical Trials. Did you see that presentation? No, I didn't see it, but I can comment if you want. (laughs) Please comment because I'm sure you can guess what it showed. And in fact, the GI panel was the only panel to have a manual, so six male presenters. The female, there was a female discussant, but all six for upper GI, I think, were male presenters. It was quite topical at this ASCO, the issue of gender equity and racism. But uh, Katie Eng is everywhere, so it's not a problem if you have her on the panel. <laughs> no. That's true. I think... It's true that not only in GI oncology, but also in medical oncology, there is still more males than females. So today we already see a switch towards more female staff members than before, not only in GI, but general. Second, if we see the staff members that are coming in the future, clearly there will be a majority of females in the department, but the organization of the department is also switching when you have more females because family is becoming, especially in the new generation of STEM members, family spare time is becoming much more important than before. So you need to reorganize also in that setting and involve them not only in clinical work, but also in scientific work. And that's the difficult balance that we see in females if you compare it with males. But also and I can speak for myself, but also Hans can speak for that, that in real life, in family time, the males are taking part much more in family than before. So we have also our tasks. So also that is changing. And probably this will reflect in the future also in the panel discussion at ASCO, hopefully. And if the Americans don't do that, we will do that from Belgium because we have excellent female staff members, not only today, but also in the future. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Now, Mark, just a couple of other questions to finish off. Do you drink more cups of coffee per day than hands? He says he drinks about eight cups of coffee a day. I think I'm the champion. Mm. Okay, how many? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this this morning already four so it's let's say 10 o'clock for the moment so then he beats me two three so that makes seven and at night another two three so i think at least 10 a day wow wow luckily it's associated with improved survival from cancer is that why you do it or is it to cope with your six children No, it's surviving my job. (laughs) Surviving your job. Look, thank you so much, Mark. We've really enjoyed having you on the podcast. We'll get you on again. Be nice to Hans. Give him a good performance review. Okay, no problem. 100 listeners. We're going to hold you to that. Okay, no problem. See you. Bye-bye. Well, g'day, g'day, g'day. I have been so looking forward to this because Pam Kunz is a very special person. I'm proud to call her a friend. We've been seeing each other at meetings for some years. She's a wonderful person. But recently she has really been leading the cause for female representation in at ASCO and in cancer and also calling out behaviour that some people have been surprised to find is very prevalent within our general community and 
therefore, I guess, no surprise in our medical and our oncology community. So we're going to chat to Pam about that a little bit later. But first, to show how smart she is as a woman, she chose to do the upper GI abstracts at ASCO this year. So Hans, maybe we'll have a bit more to talk about. Yes, let's hope so, because the lower GI yeah. was not that spectacular this year. So let's go on a little trip down the GI track, Pam. Esophagogastric, what really struck you at ASCO? I think this has been really the year for upper GI and immunotherapy. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but really we've seen in the last three or four months just FDA approval after FDA approval in this space. And I think we saw some updated data at ASCO for large studies, but we also saw some new data. So what would you like to talk about first? Should we go through Checkmate 648? Yeah, that sounds good. So this was some of the new data. So Dr. Chow presented on behalf of his colleagues. This was Ipia Nevo or Nevo plus chemo versus chemotherapy. And this was in the first line treatment for advanced esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. So I think we'd seen some advances in the adenospace, but really hadn't seen this in squamous. So I think this was exciting to see. Maybe I'll just tell the punchline first, and then we can kind of go back and look at some of the data. So really the punchline is that we probably have two new therapies, Ipinevo and then Nevo plus chemo were better than chemotherapy alone in this space in the first line setting for squamous cell carcinoma. This is not yet FDA approved, but I think that given that this is a large phase three study, we you know hope to see that. And I think you know one of the things that struck me is that we often need to tailor our treatments to patients. So having a chemo free option, I think, is really exciting, though we know that IO agents aren't without side effects. But I think really being able to tailor it to what the patient needs. And Pam, it may be of particular significance in our part of the world, because certainly in Asia, we're seeing a rise of squames, whereas everywhere else in the world, we're really seeing the reverse, a rise of the adenos. Is that true for you, Hans, and then Pam? We have it a bit, yeah, indeed 50-50, but we see indeed a rise mainly of the adenos, but the main reason is that we see less squamous now. Yeah, I think that's the same in the US. Eva, tell me a little bit why that's happening in your part of the world. It's interesting, isn't it? It's in the Asian part of the world, so and I think it's more that the adenos are associated with obesity, which is more a Western phenomenon. And there has been some, I was actually involved in some research looking at whether HPV actually is a factor in esophageal squames. And we couldn't really find evidence, although the epidemiology varies. We looked at uh, different regions in China. So that may be a factor as well. Mm -hmm. So this was a trial done in squames, a large trial. So they did well to recruit, didn't they? They did. Yeah. So it, this had over, I think it was close to a thousand patients and it was a one to one to one randomization, about 300 in each arm. And the way it was statistically designed was to compare the IO containing arms to chemo. So they really compared Nevo plus chemo versus chemo and then Nevo Ipi versus chemo. And again, both of those showed an advantage of the experimental arm. I'd like to just mention, I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the baseline characteristics. I thought it was balanced for PDL1 greater than or equal to 1%. And I think that what's interesting is that they also did an analysis looking at that group of patients, PDL1 greater than or equal to 1%. And this was you know, about half the patients in each of the arms. But then they also did an analysis that looked at all randomized patients. And we saw the benefit persist regardless of that PDL1 status. It was, I think the absolute benefit was higher in the PDL1 greater than or equal to 1%. But it was interesting. I thought that we saw benefit throughout. Well, it's a big controversy, isn't it, about PDL1 and what percent do you put it at and do you look at the less than 1% or do you only analyze them in the all comers? Mm -hmm. So we've seen that. But I mean, the question on everyone's lips surely is Nevo alone. Who wants to give Ipi? 
if you don't have to. Indeed, indeed, yeah. So hands over to you for the next study to ask about. Thanks. Yeah, you know that I don't attend these sessions. Eh? So, <laughs> so, uh, you were in the bar by now. Okay, indeed. checkmate 649 with adeno, so geojunction and gastric. Yes. So this was an update on a study that we already knew showed a benefit for first line nevo plus chemo versus chemotherapy. This patient population included gastric. So it was advanced gastric cancer, GE junction, and esophageal. So I'll add no, Eva, as you had mentioned. And this was, I'll just kind of briefly go over the studies that designed for everybody. So this was also a large study. This study compared one to one to one Nevo plus Ipi versus Nevo plus chemo, and that chemo backbone was either Fulfox or Zelox versus chemotherapy alone. And this particular update on the expanded efficacy and safety really looked at the Nevo plus chemo versus chemotherapy. And I think what we saw, so we just to remind everybody the primary endpoint, we did see a benefit in median overall survival. The Nevo containing arm was 13.8 months versus 11.6 months for chemotherapy alone with a statistically significant hazard ratio and p value. So I think, you know, one could argue is that clinically meaningful, it's about a month. And there was also a benefit in progression-free survival. I think that, you know, we also saw an update in terms of some of the response rate data and duration of response, and that similarly favored the Nevo-containing arm. And then also, I think, you know, this is one of the themes that I saw in, in some of these studies is this analysis of whether it's pdl one or CPS score, but the efficacy in this, we also saw benefit in all randomized patients. So I think it's, I think the pendulum is sort of swinging. I think some of our FDA approvals are based on a CPS score of greater than or equal to 10 or greater than or equal to five. These studies, though, I think are really broadening the eligibility of who may benefit from these agents. What I find difficult here is I think for squamous, it's quite clear, okay, PDL1 is probably less important. For gastric or gastrosphageal, it seems a bit more important. But now with all the data with Nevi Epo, but, but also with Pembro, with lots of immune therapy, it's not clear anymore which IO we should give to which patient in which line. So. Oh, I completely agree. You know, it's in fact, this is the second kind of ASCO podcast or something that I'm having to do this week. And I have to do another one next week for Gail at my institution. And I had to actually create a table for myself <laughs> to start thinking about, right, which IO agent and in which line and in which histology, it's getting quite confusing. So Pam, we might ask for that because we put all the related <laughs> articles on our website. All right, I'll send it to you. And then uh, the best podcast, isn't it? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> so Keynote 811, interesting. This was a first analysis. We've got the trial open at our centre, about to finish recruitment globally though, but we're currently recruiting and we're hearing it at ASCO. Yeah, you know, I have to say, even though this was sort of hidden in the poster discussion, I was actually most excited about this. I think it was sort of an early look at new data. We hadn't seen IO in this space before. So let's review what the study is for our for our listeners. So this is Pembro plus trastuzumab and chemotherapy for HER2 positive metastatic gastric or GE junction cancer. This is an ongoing study. So the, the study design is a one-to-one -one randomization with an accrual goal of about 700 patients, though this update was only on about 260 of those patients. So the design was Pembro plus trastuzumab and, and chemo, so that was either fluoropyrimidine plus cape or capox, versus placebo plus trastuzumab and that same chemo backbone. So this was a planned interim analysis, and we saw data on just the response rate. I wish our listeners could see the waterfall plot. I think that this was what was pretty striking. So looking at the Pembro arm, we saw an objective response rate as defined by RESIST of 74% 
versus 51% for placebo. They also looked at depth of response and duration of response. And I think that those were actually quite interesting. So depth of response, meaning the degree or percentage of response and a way that they quantitated that is that what percent of patients had a decrease of greater than or equal to 80%. And a third of patients met that. So you can imagine a a waterfall plot really with lots of long lines under that horizontal axis. And any decrease was 97%. And then the duration of response, there was also a statistically significant difference between the arms of 10.6 months for PEMBRO versus 9.5 for the placebo. So this is exciting. So in my, again, I was looking at my table. This is the first IO in the HER2 positive patient population. Again, not FDA approved, although I will say this led to accelerated approval in the U.S. And I think we don't have the final results for this phase three study. And, you know, we can talk some about that accelerated approval process, but it does kind of give patients early access to these agents, but without having the primary endpoint. And we've seen just this spring that the FDA can go back and sort of withdraw that that approval once they get the primary endpoint data or additional data, should that not pan out. But I think this is exciting. And I think the early data are very encouraging. And do you think we'll look into the future, we should add an anti-angiogenic and maybe we'll really hit the jackpot and have all targeted agents? Because there does seem to be synergy, doesn't there? Yes. I mean, though, I, you know, I always wonder, like, more is not always more. So I, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, also, Eva, maybe in the perioperative setting would be quite interesting eh? because if you see this response rate, maybe giving trastuzumab plus an IO plus chemo in the perioperative setting. I know in the US, you prefer maybe more the adjuvant, although you might have switched a bit more to the perioperative, which we already do in, in, in Europe and I think in Australia as well for quite some time, but I think this is an interesting approach. Don't start the dumb American argument. (laughs) (laughs) But I agree with you. No, I I think this is interesting. And I don't know, I wonder with this or if GE Junction or in gastric will ever go to the total neoadjuvant therapy like we're seeing in some of our other GI spaces and with response rates like this, I think that's a really interesting question. As I said, we've had some great responses on this trial and patients who are just on the HER2 and IO ongoing really have very little toxicity if they haven't got major, you know, known rarer side effects. So speaking of another, maybe a hangover showing my age, but I enjoyed the Exilox trial. Did you pick that one up, Pam? I did not look at that okay. one, Eva, but tell me why you were excited about it. I, I mean, I've, I've heard a little bit about it, but I didn't spend a lot of time on that one. Look, it basically killed the red drug. One of my <laughs> pet hates is the red drug. So, you know, it was KPOX versus EOX, and it was a non-inferiority study, basically finally putting anyone who wants to keep using epi Rubicin in uh, gastric cancer, metastatic gastric cancer to bed. And you still do that? Because it's already, I think, more than 15 years that we stopped using that here. We have such a dominant culture from the Marsden amongst Australian oncologists who've been trained, you know, and EOX was the poster child, but no, I think it's been put to bed, but this is the final nail in the coffin. Is it used much in... We do not use it much. And, you know, and I think in my training, I think that triplets were still used some, but I think that even then the pendulum was swinging away and I've just never seen the, the, I've seen it added toxicity without much benefit for the triplets. And I'm so glad that it's good. Some of those simple studies um, are really important. Great. So did you have any other esophagogastric, or should we move to pancreas, which I thought was quite interesting, this ASCO. So maybe just, I wanted to just to mention, even though this was also an update, was the adjuvant study. This was Checkmate 577. Of course. And just because I think it raises some really practical questions, and I something that has come up actually a few times in clinic recently, and I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on this. So I'll just remind the listeners. So this is 
adjuvant nevo in resected esophageal or gastroesophageal junction cancer following neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So the design of this study is a two-to-one randomization. This is for patients who've had neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy and surgical resection and R0 resection and have residual pathologic disease and then are randomized to receive two-to-one nevo or placebo. And the primary endpoint of the study has been previously reported. This was an update. Disease-free survival favored the NEVO arm. Um, Actually, pretty remarkable difference. So 22 months for NEVO and 11 months for placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and a statistically significant p-value. And the distant metastasis-free survival showed a significant difference. You know, one thing I sort of just from a practical standpoint, I think the reason this is interesting, we've in the U.S., I think we use CrossSum. We've also started adopting the CALGB 80803, which is the, you know, neoadjuvant full FOX plus chemoradiotherapy that showed a higher path CR rate. And I think that the question is, what do you do with a patient with a path CR in this setting? And I think we don't know the answer, but I think that that's a real practical clinical question. Or what do you do for these patients who maybe have, you know, don't have residual disease afterwards or maybe not don't fit this eligibility criteria perfectly? So I'm curious to know what you guys think about that. I think it's a difficult one. It's it's. If you look at rectal cancer, then the prognosis is so good that I don't think that you need to add something. In esophageal is a bit different, although the prognosis is better than the ones with complete pathological complete response. But I don't know the answer as well. It's also difficult because you have so many different regimens. We've, you know, and geo junction, and you know, it's it's a very messy area, but. You know, it did feed into this DFS debate for adjuvant. Do we need to wait for OS? So that was another theme of of ASCO, and we've certainly discussed it at many of our other ASCO podcasts because it was there in lung, it was there in renal, it was there all over the place. Pam, what's your view? Do we need to wait for OS data before we bring in an adjuvant immunotherapy you know, the expense, the toxicity, risk of overtreatment. So very interested to know your view. It's a tough question to answer. I I wish I was a part of your, or at least a listener for your prior debates. It's a good question. I mean, I think as a purist and as a clinical trialist, I think we like to see really strong OS data. I think we've certainly seen Some of these studies have early efficacy signals without OS, and then it ends up not panning out. So I think that that's hard. I know certainly even one of the diseases that you and I study in neuroendocrine tumors, that's actually an impractical endpoint. So we actually never use OS. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. I'm a little bit mixed on this. Well, I saw ASCO change their breast cancer guidelines to now recommend adjuvant elaparib. And that's also on DFS data. So interesting. Oh, look, I get most of my medical information these days from Twitter, Pam, and it's <laughs> a hot debate raging there. So you've got two camps and I think it's super interesting. And feel free to listen to our other podcast. I will. I will <laughs> listen to that one. Okay. So pancreas cancer, did you find it interesting this year? So I'll be honest, I'm looking at some of my notes. I mean, I would, the upper GI was really dominated by esophageal. You tell me what you found interesting in pancreas and I, but I focused mostly at my, my review and reading and listening on the upper GI as opposed to pancreas, but I'd love to hear from you on that. Oh, sure. Look, just, there was the JCOG 1407 study in locally advanced that was comparing the triplet fulfurinox to gemabraxane. Now, whether we can extrapolate the data to metastatic disease, we know actually we can't to adjuvant, but it really showed non-inferiority and better tolerance for the gemabraxane. Yes, so, that's right. I do remember listening to that. And yeah, very interesting. 
I think it's a very important message because if we speak with our surgeons, they only know one thing now, which is fulfirinox. And if I say, okay, in the, even in a new adjuvant setting or locally advanced, and you want to get them operable, and I say, okay, let's give these patients some Sartivin plus Napaclitaxel, they always say, no, 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 you have to give fulfirinox. While I say the other regimen is not bad, so we can give the other one as well. So I think this is a very important study. Yeah, and especially for some of our older or worse performance status patients, I think that's important. And I think that's becoming a theme of of trying to figure out how we can best optimally treat that patient population. I don't remember, Eva, the breakdown of age for that population was that or for that study. I think there were, I certainly remember that there may have been selection bias involved in that and the, you know, whether that typically represents our clinic population. But, you know, interesting also, you can choose, great to have a choice, you know, more diarrhea with the fulfirinox, more heme toxicity with the gemnab pacli. But there was an imbalance. I think there was a about a 10-year age difference between the groups and also a better performance status. So those are factors to consider. Mm-hmm. We have trouble getting ports into people. Do you? That's interesting. Delays. So, you know, patients often wait two, three weeks. Yeah. So having the Gemnab Paclitaxel is a, a good option for you. Yeah. So, look, the reason why I thought pancreas was interesting were really the new targets, and these were very small studies, but, you know, nothing usually works very well in pancreas, so even small studies. So we had the NRG1 fusions and Xenocutuzumab. We need Can you repeat that, uh, please? <laughs> <laughs> we always laugh on the podcast about pronunciation, and we usually yes. have... Craig Underhill, who's the king of pronunciation. But also there was some RET fusions data found in RET positive. So do you routinely molecularly characterize your pancreatic patients? You're at Yale. You should be able to do what none of us else can do. (laughs) You know, I think we are increasingly doing that. And I think I'll give you a suggestion for another podcast guest. Kim Rice Binder is a GI oncologist who studies pancreas cancer and has an interest in DNA repair inhibition. And she gave us a really fabulous talk very recently on how she envisions the future of pancreas cancer treatment really being these smaller patient populations that have targets. So that's exciting. You know, even if we have a group that's three to 5% of that patient population, pancreas cancer has been really a tough nut to crack in terms of make, having incremental gains. And I, so I, I agree with you, Eva. I think that seeing some of these data are exciting hopeful, I think, for this patient population where we've really not seen advances beyond cytotoxic chemo. But I think an important message there is that, okay, for pancreas, you could theoretically start with looking at RAS mutations. You know, most of the cases have a RAS mutation. If they don't have a RAS mutation, if they're a young patient, especially below 60, then you should look for these energy fusions. You can't look for them in all of them. And we have a program, and I think it's it's in lots of centers in young patients that it's offered by the company and to have whole exome sequencing also to look at energy fusions. Yep, yep. And while we're we're talking about it, though this is slightly different, I think reminding our listeners of germline testing in this patient population as well. So I think it's, you know, reflexively, you know, we're now doing germline. I think most people are just given, you know, to look for BRCA mutations. And, but I think the somatic profiling is just as important in this group. Agreed. So Pam, over to you. Any trial you want to talk about? I don't think there was a lot in NETS. There was not. So I, we don't even need to go there. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, nothing all that exciting. You know, I'm trying to think even in NETS, you know, there was One of the things we're all eager to hear more about, there wasn't a ton of data, but is thinking about alpha emitters 
for neuroendocrine tumors, there was an, uh, so just a very small update on a phase one study of an alpha emitter of lead 212. So no, no big updates there, but I think we're eager to see where our alpha emitter agents, this is a form of peptide receptor radiotherapy, where that goes. And there was an update of, of Netter 1 overall survival data. That's, I'd say, the only the main takeaway. I think it was disappointing to see that the overall survival was not statistically significant in terms of the difference. I would argue that it was clinically significant. It was well over a year. I think it was maybe 12-ish months of an OS difference between the two arms, but it didn't meet their pre-planned statistical analysis in terms of the difference there. Any other studies in any other GI organs? There wasn't much in biliary, a second-line study with Nell Iri. Yeah, that was the only other one that I thought was worth maybe mentioning, just because I think we always need second-line in that population. I mean, I'd say that in the last year, it's really been around FGFR, you know, fusion mutations. and But this, I think, is also a practical study where I think the use of arinotecan, we many of us use full fury in the second line without strong evidence. And so I think to have this, so I'll just remind the, the listeners. So this study design was a one-to-one randomization. This is patients with metastatic biliary tract cancers. They randomized about 175 patients one-to-one to receive naliri plus 5-FU leucovorin versus 5-FU leucovorin. And this did show a statistically significant difference in progression-free survival and overall survival. So not a huge study, but I think that this is important for that patient population and nice to have another option. It was called the NIFTY study. It was NIFTY. I would say the control arm was probably historically accurate, but doesn't really reflect what people Totally agree. There was actually another targeted study looking at berametuzumab or BEMA, I think they call it, actually coming out of the biliary work but into gastric cancer. So this was in FGFR positive gastric cancer. So I think your comments about pancreas cancer will very much apply also to gastric cancer, you know, between your MSI subgroups, your HER2 positive, that's really splitting into very different diseases now. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It makes our jobs hard as we're trying to think about which agents apply. But I think that that is such an important take home, Eva, that we have to be thinking about these smaller subgroups really for all of our diseases. I think GI is complicated with 12, 13 different organ types already, but I think that they're becoming smaller as we split them by molecular subtype. I used to envy the breast cancer doctors, just, and, <laughs> but I guess they're subspecialized now into I only see her two positive. Right, cancer. right, right. Amazing. So Pam, overall, did you enjoy ASCO or do you wish we were all there together? I wish we were there together. I know. I admit, I think we're all desperate for some personal interaction. But I have to say, I think they did a very nice job. I think this year, last year was sort of a let's figure it out and have some sort of ASCO. But this year, I think they really had more discussions. Those were really fun. I participated in some of those. You know, I think they did a really nice job. You know, it's, it's tricky with you know, I think they still had 40,000 or so people listening in and they had, I really liked the theme that Dr. Pierce had in terms of equity for every patient. I think that was so timely this year and I think really important. So let's talk about that because that's really an area that, you know, I don't remember seeing before plenaries about racism, not only inequities for cancer patients, but for providers we had a number of amazing talks and then of course your work leading gender equity and this issue of sexual harassment which has hit our GI community particularly. Indeed where do we begin Eva? So uh, maybe first a broad comment. I think we should be proud as a community that ASCO is dedicating airtime to this. And I think that I was really excited about that. And I think both from the patient side and from the provider side. And it's 
overdue. And I really hope that this theme, you know, continues as we really in all of our professional society meetings and would kind of, again, challenge our listeners to think about how to do that and what they do day to day. And that's certainly something I've been reflecting on myself is how can I look at my research through the lens of equity? And I think that is in and of itself really motivating and I laugh a little, maybe this is some part of my midlife crisis and needing some social advocacy in what I do, but I think it's time that we all really think about doing that. Yes, and I'll put in a plug for our upcoming OJC podcast, actually on Indigenous people and cancer, because here in Australia, Pam, although we don't have the extremes that you have in the US with some of your different societal groups, we certainly have gross inequity with our Indigenous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in their outcomes, not only from cancer, but in the area of cancer, very striking and across the board from prevention screening right through to treatment. So that's really become the focus. We're developing a national cancer plan and there is a big focus on that. That's great. Good. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm happy to speak about, I had sort of two different sessions that I was personally involved in, but there was really, I think, and maybe just to give a little history. So last year for the first time, ASCO created a scientific track to really examine workforce disparities. It's embedded in the kind of professional development and education advances track, but they had never had a scientific track. And this was because they were seeing an increasing number of scientific abstracts looking at objective data around workforce disparities. And that was true again this year. And so it was actually almost two years ago that we pitched this session on gender disparities in the workforce with really an eye to thinking about solutions. And we chose last year to, it was supposed to happen in 2020, but I think with the pandemic and with really a desire to have a robust discussion, we put it off a year hoping we'd be in person, but we pivoted and still had a really great discussion. So that session I chaired, it was really the, you know, my panelists that had I'd say really great talks on solutions. So Dr. Reshma Jagsi, who's a radiation oncologist, spoke about the objective data. She personally has contributed a lot to this space. I think, you know, we wanted to set the stage with that foundation of the objective data demonstrating gender disparities in really across authorship, salary, you know, faculty rank, et cetera. It really spans many different arenas. And then Dr. Hannah Valentine is actually a cardiologist. We brought in some non-oncologists to help us talk. She's a cardiologist and was the inaugural chief scientific diversity officer at the National Institute of Health. She has just recently stepped down from that role, but she gave us some great examples of solutions on how to do cohort hiring to bring in more diverse faculty. That was one example. And then Dr. Leon McDougall is a family medicine doctor at The Ohio State, and he is the current president of the National Medical Association. And so he brought in a wonderful perspective on intersectionality or intersectional feminism, which is really defined as, you know, the fact that Yes, gender, we can experience disparities because of gender, but women who also carry other marginalized characteristics or underrepresented characteristics, such as being BIPOC, affiliating with the LGBTQ plus community, disabled, different culture, ethnicity. I mean, those different characteristics can really compound each other and create additional burdens for those women. So he talked about that and about how men can be allies. And then we ended with a great talk from Ms. Deanna Smith, who's the CEO of Sarah Cannon Research Institute, which is a large sort of private group throughout the United States. And she talked about empowering female leaders. And I loved her analogy, which was creating a tapestry of allies. And so it was really kind of reimagining or redefining the mentor role. I think the mentor is really very hierarchical in kind of how we've traditionally thought of that in medicine and allies are really, I think, can serve just a different role. So that was fun. I think it was very uplifting. And I think the focus on solutions was really important. 
Well, Hans will know uh, that almost every OJC podcast, so we have regular episodes where we just do a journal club and almost everyone I have something about women in academic medicine or something around the, we even had Med Bikini feature once. On our, <laughs> oh, you uh, did. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. But it really is an issue and it's an issue for leadership, not just participation, because we know that actually women's participation in medicine is actually now over 50% in many areas. Indeed. But it's the leadership. So we look to people like you, Pam, and the mentorship is so important. Hans, did you have a comment there? Actually, I do, because okay, also we, so Mark and myself, are trying to get more female staff members here, but without being too sexist, it means that you also have to reorganize the way you work. Because as you know, we have to take into account that yeah, some tasks, females do more than men, although this, this is changing. But you have to take into account that there are kids that can be sick, you have to take care of them. When it's exams like now, they have to study together with them. So it's not like let's say 10, 20 years ago, where you could spend in the office between 8 in the morning and 11 in the evening. So I think you have to also think of how to reorganize your way of working. And I'm not in favor of staying too long in the office. There are a lot of things you can do at home as well for your work. I noticed that the sabbatical, you were actually barely in the office. And I don't think you're at home working. It's the first time my kids saw me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his kids want him to come back to Australia because yeah, just because they <laughs> saw me there. so much there. Yeah. But you know, it's really interesting, isn't it, about how men react to this? Because I think most women, it's just a given. But you know, for example, our colorectal MDT starts at seven thirty in the morning. You know, that's just one example. The number of meetings that are after hours, you know. The beauty is that the newer generations, whatever sex they are, don't want to do any work. Yeah. You know, work like we have done after hours. And I think that's a real plus. I agree. You know, it's, I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic is sort of creating a little bit more flexibility with Zoom meetings. And although I have to say Zoom has taken over my life, but there has been some flexibility. And I don't think anyone's going to stand for showing up in person for a 7 a.m. meeting anymore. And we are doing a test in our division of oncology at Yale this summer of no meetings before eight and or after five. I think we all have to advocate for that. Like you said, regardless of, you know, male, female, I think that it's important to be thinking about work-life balance and burnout prevention and, and things like that. And on that, how has the pandemic impacted your workforce in terms of burnout. I know in Australia, the minute the borders open, every oncologist is getting on a plane. We'll have nobody here doing any work. They're all saving up their leave. We can't get anyone to take holidays. We're busting to travel. But there is really a burnout factor. We're seeing here from fatigue, just from lots of work with no breaks, but not from having a huge COVID load, thankfully. You've had both. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think, um, Eva, you know this, but I I moved mid-pandemic. And so I had an interesting year. I moved from California to Connecticut. And where we were in California, we had very, very low COVID numbers in Northern California. And actually in New Haven, Connecticut, which is really between, you know, Boston and New York, we had really high COVID numbers. And so you're right, we had to deal with a hospital that was full of COVID patients and many of our ambulatory services, including oncology, really, I think, were displaced, some because of that. And I think it's it created a huge stress on our staff in particular and physicians, and we've already seen turnover because of that. One thing I've been reflecting on as a leader trying to lead in a predominantly virtual space in the last year, that's been tricky to create a sense of community and belonging and team in a virtual world. And I think when we're in person, that those connections are easier to make. And I think often also prevent burnout. But I think when you're only seeing 
people virtually, you don't have that level of connection. And, you know, that's hard to fix on a systems level, but it's just an observation. I think we will be in a different world practicing, won't we? And for better or worse, some things better and some things, you know, not as good. But one thing that really is for sure, Pam, I really miss you. I want to give you a big hug. I know, me too. We need to do another one of our calm nets in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Sitting on the beach, chilling out. Yes. Yeah. And we might even invite hands one time. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask. Yeah. You can come. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, Pam, look, it's been absolutely wonderful. I congratulate you on your leadership in that area of such importance. It goes hand in hand with advances that we're making in molecular diagnostics and therapeutics. We really need this very holistic approach. We can have the best drugs, but if patients can't get access to them or physicians, you know, don't represent the people that are treating, then something's not quite right. I agree. It's been a great pleasure, Pam, and we'll have you on again, I hope, very soon. Thank you, Hans, very much. Thank you, Eva. Yes, thank you for inviting me. How many cups of coffee are you up to now, Hans? Seven, and it's only two o'clock in the afternoon, so I still have one to go. <laughs> Pam, how many are you up to? Only one. It's only 7.52 here at (laughs) a.m. Yes, talking about before 7 a.m. meetings and you, you kindly did this to cope with all the time zones. Thank you so much. Keep safe and see you real soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.